Welcome. My name is John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. On Monday, June 22nd, the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, announced Daniel Allen, the winner of the 2020 Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity. This prestigious award is given biennially to a person whose career reflects the notion that ideas matter, that thought must inform policymaking for the nation to thrive and for humankind to advance. No one better exemplifies these principles than Dr. Allen, whose work as a leading scholar and author on democracy, justice, and citizenship has had a profound public impact as the director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. She is also Harvard's James Bryant Conant University professor in the government department. Dr. Allen has a PhD in classics from King's College, Cambridge, and a PhD in political philosophy from Harvard. Today, for her first Library of Congress event as the Kluge Prize winner, we thought we'd ask Dr. Allen for her thoughts on some of the difficult questions we all face in this challenging time. Danielle, congratulations and welcome. Thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's been such a thrilling time since the announcement, so thank you. Yeah, well, we're really happy to have you on board at the Library of Congress. My first question has to do with the pandemic. The Safra Center put out a blueprint on how America should deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. It seems publicly and privately to me that the conversation about it always seems to come around to, once we have a vaccine, we can get back to normal. But it really isn't that easy, is it? It's not that easy. So first we should spend a minute talking about that vaccine idea and concept. Um, in the first instance, I think estimates about when we would have a vaccine ready for distribution are spring to summer 21. So in other words, a year from now or nearly a year from now, there's a heck of a lot of time for a lot of people to get quite sick between now and then. So we have a lot of work to do just given how much time there's likely to be before there's anything like broad distribution of a vaccine. There's another thing that really matters though. At this point, we still don't actually know how much immunity a vaccine would confer. Will it be more like the polio vaccine and provide durable permanent immunity or more like a flu shot, right? Where it actually has kind of uneven success and you need something new every year and there's uneven uptake in terms of the number of people who get the shot. So, the odds are, since we've actually never had a, a vaccine for coronavirus, um, and given what we know about the kind of immunity that comes from having had coronaviruses, the odds are that this will be more like a flu shot than like a polio vaccine. So we are probably going to be living with this disease in an ongoing way. That means we have to be actually ready. We have to build up our health infrastructure, our infrastructure of community health resilience, to ensure that when there are outbreaks in the future, as there are bound to be, we're ready for them. Is there, is, apart from what you just said, what would be one other takeaway from the, the Safra Center report that you'd like people to hear? Well, the biggest takeaway is that it is within our power to suppress the disease. This is the part of the conversation people have not focused on. There's really a strategic choice to be made. Do we want to mitigate the disease, which just means slow the spread? Or do we want to suppress it, which means get down to near zero case incidents? Every country that has chosen suppression has their economy open, stably, and safely. They have people back in school. They have people participating in a full range of ordinary social activity. And I'm talking about democracies here. I'm talking about Taiwan. I'm talking about Australia, New Zealand, Germany, South Korea. Those countries chose suppression, the goal of getting down to near zero case incidents. Taiwan had positive GDP growth in the first quarter by virtue of choosing this strategy. So the most important takeaway of our report is that this country too should choose as its strategic goal, suppression. We should not be satisfied with mitigation. We're seeing right now the consequences of having chosen mitigation as we see cases continuing to rise throughout the country. And we're seeing people deliberate about closing shops and stores again, or we see Texas, for example, deliberating about walking back on openings. This is not necessary. We need to invest in an infrastructure of diagnostic viral testing, contact tracing, and supported isolation at a sufficiently ambitious scale to suppress the disease. This is still within our power. It is a mistake not to do it. 
Is there something about our civic culture that makes us makes it more difficult for us as compared to some of these other countries, Australia, Taiwan? Well, you know, it's interesting that there is a real distinction between how the young democracies and the old democracies have handled this. We have to recognize the fact that we are the world's oldest democracy. I fear that there's a certain sclerosis um, in how we operate, a certain sclerosis in our capacity for governance. So the young democracies, they did it. They had no problem seeing the goal and activating their people based on resources of voluntarism and solidarity to deliver the participation in a program of suppression that was needed. Um, we have not achieved that. The United Kingdom has achieved that. France and Italy struggled mightily in contrast to Germany, which has a sort of post-World War II um, political structure in all reality. So at any rate, um, we lacked effective governance um, through this crisis. And there's a lot that can be said about that. Um, and yes, it, that has hampered us. Staying on the on the on the idea about about our democracy and taking a different tack, uh, given that it's an election year, the U.S. has had regular and frequent elections every two years at the federal level for 230 years. No other country has that track record. We're an old democracy, as you just said. What makes us different that we've been able to do that when other places haven't? I think there are a couple of really important things. One is a recognition that constitutional democracy is actually not at the end of the day about majoritarianism per se. It's not actually about majority vote. Sometimes people equate democracy and majority vote. That's a mistake. A constitutional democracy is about a toolkit, a set of tools that give the people broadly the power of self-government and that balance and share and distribute power. And to achieve this, you need majority vote in some places, but you also need minority protecting mechanisms. So, for example, in the design of the Constitution, the Electoral College is a minority protecting mechanism. It was designed to make sure that less populous states um, weren't perpetually in a weak position in relationship to more populous states. Um, and throughout our system and structure, we have both tools that reflect majority vote approach and tools that are minority protecting mechanisms. It's the combination of those things that has given our Constitution flexibility and durability, because at the end of the day, those who lose out in any given political decision need a reason to stay invested in the system as a whole. And so you have to have weights and counterweights that make sure that there's space made for the minority point of view as well as for the majority point of view. So that would be the first key point. The second key point is simply that our constitution was designed for flexibility. The Declaration of Independence invokes the idea that it's the job of the people to alter its institutions when it sees that they're not securing rights. The designers of the Constitution built in the amendment power. They built in, of course, the electoral system as a way of constantly delivering change. So our frequent elections, the amendment system and the Constitution and so forth, all those things are tools that have given us adaptability over time. The third thing, of course, we can talk about it later if you want, because it's a big, big theme is the question of the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln and the principles of union that he established as fundamental to the success of the country. Right. And that's and that's uh, one of the, to me, an obvious follow up is so we've had all this success. And it was, I, I think, uh, a, a question for debate in the 1860s, whether Lincoln would permit elections to go forward in 1862 and 1864. And he did. But it did uh, in order to sustain the the democracy that we have, it did require upheaval at, a, at, a, at an extraordinary level. Right. Well, it required war. We have to be honest about that, right? So we do tell ourselves a story about continuity, and that's real in the sense that Lincoln maintained the functioning of those institutions throughout. So the union never failed. It continued to function. For a period of time, it lost a portion of itself, and it had to use war to get it back. But that was a really critical moment and point because it did make the point that there is no grounds for succession. You can't actually maintain a constitutional democracy over time unless people are committed to the institutions themselves. Um, and that means it has to be, in an important way, a commitment to compromise, but also in an important way, um, a commitment to the idea that the union of that constitutional system is actually more important than the policy um, objectives that one has in any particular substantive domain of policy. The uh, we're, we're hitting you with a lot of hard questions, of course, and uh, the hard one now. A lot of commentators say, "Well, it's it's not a given 
that, that that people in power step down. People always have in the United States when they're when their party or, or when a president uh, is defeated. Um, is that something that concerns you? I'm not concerned about that, in all honesty. I think in many ways, although I do think that our political institutions are sclerotic, um, that we have great weaknesses and erosion of capacity and governance, and that's throughout our whole system, not just at the federal level, but also in relationship between the federal government and the states and people's general understanding of our whole system. Also, although I think we have kind of problems of sclerosis, I've also seen remarkable resilience in our political institutions over the last few years. So I've watched a court system that has really stuck to its guns in terms of defending basic principles of law and constitutionalism. Uh, we've watched Congress rediscover the debate about what its powers should be and rediscover um, the project of how to make sure that the executive branch and the legislative branch are actually in a checking relationship in relationship to each other. Um, we've also watched the military defend constitutional values and speak up on behalf of, for example, um, the First Amendment right to assembly. Um, so in that regard, I see resilience in our system, and that gives me confidence that we have what it takes to make it through even a moment of disturbance and crisis. So the, the hardening of the arteries isn't past the point of no return. That, that's it's not past the point of no return, exactly. Yeah. Work, to, work to be done. We you know, got to get ourselves exercising or whatnot. <laughs> so, so with respect to uh, work to be done and uh, and, and change, uh, the ongoing Black Lives uh, Matter protests have, of course, gotten a tremendous amount of attention. And uh, we've had protest movements in the past going back pretty much throughout our, our country's history. Is there something that determines whether a protest movement, are there things that determine whether a protest movement achieves its ends? Can you identify what a success, what, what it means to have a successful protest movement? Absolutely. I mean, there are a few key things. I really always, in thinking about this question, draw on the work of a remarkable scholar at the New School named Diva Woodley, who's written a lot about this question, and she draws contrasts between different social movements. And she makes the point that one of the most important things is that uh, social movements have to really transform public opinion, actually. So that's one of the first pillars of success. Um, and so she contrasts, for example, the living wage movement and the marriage equality movement. Um, when the marriage equality movement sort of reframed its project um, from a vocabulary of gay rights to a vocabulary of marriage equality, what they were doing was um, changing the frame of an argument that said this is about a particular group of people and their particular needs to the argument that this is about what all people need. All people need the freedom to choose to be with the person they love. And we are in that group of people who need that. And so that reframing from the needs of a sort of subset or a particular group to a broader universal picture um, drove a huge shift in public opinion and really supported local level policy changes and then ultimately the Supreme Court decision-making around marriage equality. Um, so the same thing is happening now. It's really an extraordinary thing with um, the Black Lives Matter campaign and movement for Black Lives, the huge shifts in public opinion about what African-Americans experience in this country in relationship to the police. Um, and these shifts have been actually underway for some time. So astonishingly, even in 2016, people don't know this, but even in 2016, um, the Black Lives Matter movement polled at higher levels of approval than either presidential candidate, either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. So the incredible upswelling we're seeing now of support um, for the cause of racial equity, um, racial equality was already underway in 2016. And it really does flow from the work of this movement over time. So that really is the first thing, the sort of transformation of public understanding and public opinion. The second thing, of course, is then the connection of that change in public opinion to specific proposals for de specific decision makers. It's really notable that a week or so ago, the state legislature in Colorado approved a package of reforms related to the justice system with only one dissenting vote. So that was a kind of degree of bipartisanship on a controversial issue that we would have thought of as inconceivable six months ago. So the point is that by combining changes in public opinion with really concrete policy proposals to put to legislators, this social movement has been able to change the horizons of the possible. Is that, uh, do you see parallels with the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s? 
There certainly are parallels, and then there are also important differences. So, I mean, the parallels relate to the transformation of public opinion. Um, lots of people have written about how the photos that came out of the nonviolent protests and the ways we were met with violence, um, those photos really transformed American public opinion. So without any question, that cultural work, I like to talk about Dr. King's prophetic work, um, were fundamental to the sea changes of that era. Relatedly, so too was the work of putting specific policy proposals in front of decision makers. Um, you know, Lyndon Johnson worked very closely with leaders from the civil rights movement to formulate the 1964 Civil Rights Act, for example. So the work of changing public opinion and the work of changing laws went hand in hand. So those would be parallels. A really fundamental difference, however, is that the middle of the 20th century civil rights movement really focused on um, the sort of upfront leaders and a very leader-driven hierarchical organizational structure. The movement for Black Lives has explored and innovated with an incredibly networked structure of organization. So this has permitted people all over the country to participate um, to some degree to align, but also to figure out what are the courses of action they'd like to pursue in their own specific communities. Um, and so this networked approach to social organizing is a genuine innovation. It's also opened up opportunities for leadership for a much broader category of people, for women as well as men, for people with a range of sexual identities, for example. Um, so it's a much more open, flexible, broadly egalitarian organizational structure than would be said to have characterized the middle of the 20th century civil rights movement. You know, it, it, it may say something about, about how, how we process information as human beings that uh, that that uh, the story has it that the that the video of the Birmingham police uh, sticking attack dogs on on nonviolent protesters and the water hoses that sort of thing got a lot of attention got even even President Kennedy's attention and then and then now you have a an equally vivid video of George Floyd being being killed by that uh, by that policeman it, it's interesting that that that's the, almost what it takes sometimes doesn't isn't it well, it's certainly the case that sometimes people have to see it with their own eyes to believe it. And it's a complicated subject when you live in a mass democracy such as ours, 330 million people. How is it that people really come to possess a sense of connection to one another? We live in such disparate contexts, geographically different, socially different, and so forth. So with all that underlying diversity, it can be very hard for narratives to rise to the surface and achieve conviction, um, plausibility, and so forth. So I do think the video documentation has been fundamental to connecting an entire society. We all saw the same thing um, in our families, in our homes. We all had to all talk about what we saw, what was the moral valence of what we saw with George Floyd's killing. Um, so that, I think, is a really a powerful, important part of the story. A leading political science scientist of another generation once wrote, quote, democracy was made for the people, not the people for democracy, end quote. What's one critical thing we need to do to make our democracy better? So this is a subject very near and dear to my heart. And I do think, you know, I always push back against the what's the one thing question. And I'll tell you why I can give you a reason for that. I think you always have to say, that we need at least three things. All right, and then go, we'll, we'll go for three. That's a All right, but the reason we need three things is because a democracy, a healthy democracy, depends on a virtuous circle linking responsive, functional political institutions that empower people to civil society organizations that support bridging across difference to a civic culture that sustains a sense of citizens' mutual commitment to one another and to their constitutional democracy. So you have to do work in political institutions, on civil society, and on civic culture simultaneously. So anybody who says, you know, what's the one thing we should do for our democracy? The answer back should be, well, no, we need three things. Okay, so here are the three things. If I had to pick my top three, we need ranked choice voting in our political institutions. That's not a very glamorous sounding concept. It's just a voting method whereby you get to pick not just your first choice, but your first, your second, your third, and so forth. And if your first choice candidate does not get enough votes to rise into the top category, your vote rolls down to your second choice candidate. What ranked choice voting does is expand the diversity of candidates who enter 
the ideological diversity and the demographic diversity and so forth. It's a way of taking the sort of polarization and partisanship out of our politics, giving us more moderate options, but also uh, likely, and evidence suggests, results in more women being elected to office, um, more minorities being elected to office. So it's a way of giving ourselves more electoral flexibility so that we can have more representative institutions. So that would be the institutional reform. In civil society, I think we really need to work on helping people have a healthy information ecosystem. And we're talking about this work for our work together at the library. I think social media is a little bit like life in middle school. And to build and juxtapose to that something I would call civic media. We can use the same tools, the same platforms, but we have to use them in ways that support healthy deliberation and healthy interaction among citizens. There are great examples out there. Lexington, Kentucky has a great program called Civic Lex that I will hope to talk to you more about. And I hope the library can really engage in helping people figure out what's civic media in contrast to social media. And then the third thing we need is about that civic culture. And here too, I'm really looking forward to working with the library. Um, so we have struggled in this country for the last two decades to find a way of narrating our shared history that we can all latch onto. We are split between those who want to tell the glory story of America with all of its incredible achievements and those who focus on telling the gory story, the story of the crimes against humanity, of enslavement and the displacement and extermination of native peoples. So both of these things are part of our story. This is a place of great invention and accomplishment. We have brought things into being on the world stage that hadn't previously existed, constitutional democracy being first and foremost. We have also a history of crimes against humanity. And we have to be able to tell that story together. We have to be able to find a way of narrating a shared history. So I'm really looking forward to exploring with the library how we can engage Americans all over the country and the question of how we tell our story. Can we be inventive and creative and find ways of being honest about our past without slipping into cynicism? Find ways of being appreciative of our past without tipping into deification. I think those criteria are my standards for the kind of story we should tell about ourselves. We, we need that shared story to invigorate a civic culture of shared commitment to each other and to our constitutional democracy. So we'll get back in a second to the, the work the work we're going to do together at the library and, and with you and the and the Safra Center, which you've you've given us a preview of, uh, which which is uh, really exciting. Um, and you know, I, I, going back to your first point about institutional change, it's it, like you said, it sounds like kind of a boring thing. Let's have ranked choice voting. Um, but uh, one of the arguments for ranked choice voting, uh, other than the ones you you gave uh, about more moderate options. Uh, is that, in fact, it can be demonstrated, can it be demonstrated uh, analytically that, that ranked choice voting produces candidates who are more widely preferred? By exactly. Which should be the objective of democracy. Nothing's perfect in democracy, God knows, isn't either. But, it, but the, the best you can do, which is a good thing, is to, to have a candidate who is preferred more widely than somebody else, right? Absolutely. With our current voting mechanism, it's possible for somebody to win with just what we call plurality of the vote. That is, they happen to have the most votes, but they don't have a majority of the whole population. So more people voted against them than voted for them, and yet they win. So ranked choice voting gets rid of that possibility because you have to actually accumulate enough votes to generate a majority, an actual majority, in order to win. And yes, uh, in order for democracy to be on sound foundations, you want to make sure that your elected officials really are the people preferred by the majority of the population. So um, you, you, you went uh, in the direction of uh, the work we're going to do together with the library. Uh, can you tell us any more about the plans that you have going forward, uh, both with the library and, and outside the library? Sure. Well, I mean, I think there are several themes that we're focused on as we try to help the country have a conversation about our common purpose. So we do want to spend some time talking about that civic media concept um, that I mentioned. We want to spend some time talking about political institutions and how to help people both understand their institutions of governance and also begin to use them again more effectively. And finally, we want to talk about our common culture, the question of how we respect um, the sources of the viewpoints of others and how we can engage democratically across lines of difference. The 
historical conversation that I mentioned would be a part of that. So I'm looking forward to brainstorming ways of organizing convenings that would bring Americans from all over the country into the conversation about these themes. Um, there's also lots of great work happening in the country. There's a terrific um, entity called Civics Now, which is leading reform on civic education. And they are working with other partners to develop a blueprint for K through 12 civic education for the country. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to share material from that project and engage the public in, in exploring what they think of it. Um, what, what do they like about it? Where do they see challenges? How do we build cross-partisan or cross-ideological support for renewing civic education in this country? Um, there are other folks who are experimenting with various kinds of um, deliberative mechanisms online, conversational mechanisms online that give people the chance to participate in shaping agendas for their communities. I would love to talk with the library about drawing on some of those tools and mechanisms so that we can have really interactive conversations about these key themes um, with the American public. And with regard to information and civic media, I mean, libraries are at the heart of supporting and developing the strength of people to sort the sort of wheat from the chaff in our public conversation. And I think we're overdue for a conversation about how to do that. How do we really support education for digital media literacy? Um, how do we help people see the difference between civic media and social media? So again, I think there's we have lots to do to nail down the specifics of programming, ranging from small convenings to workshop problems to larger forms of engagement with the broad public. Um, and I look forward to figuring that out. And uh, just for, for our viewers' uh, information, uh, our, our program over the next year or more uh, together with Danielle and the library is recalling our common purpose. And uh, we're really looking forward to working with you on that, Danielle. And most importantly, congratulations. You're in elite company, to say the least, as the only the 12th winner of the, the Kluge Prize. And uh, we're proud to, to have uh, uh, selected you, the librarian selected you um, as, as that person. And uh, we're looking forward to working with you. It's a tremendous honor and the pleasure is so much mine. I am so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.